The following podcast was produced in house for KQEK.com. In celebration of National Canadian Film Day, I've chosen to present some bonus material content for KQEK.com, featuring an edited version of the engaging and amusing Q&A with actor and artist Stephen Lack, and now magazine senior film writer Norman Wilner, that followed the April 20th free screening of David Cronenberg's Scanners at Toronto's Royal Cinema. National Canadian Film Day was created by Real Canada, a non-profit organization that promotes and celebrates Canadian film and film culture with free screenings, Q&As, and other salutes across the country. Their mandate is to engage and instill a sense of pride in our homegrown industry that's faced tough battles against Hollywood Studios' control of cinema chains, investment challenges, and the difficulties in a film getting screen time, promotion, and even an HD home video release. To compensate for rather hellish distribution issues, Real Canada has an extensive catalog of films that are available to educational institutions, including many films still not commercially available on home video. Full details are available at canadianfilmday.ca. I'll have more thoughts on our distribution conundrums at the end of the Q&A, topics that will recur in my next podcast on Canada's first feature-length 3D horror film, The Mask, But for now, listen to Stephen Lack discussing Scanner's 35 years of cult fame, blowing up Louis Del Grande's head, co-star Patrick McGuhan, director David Cronenberg, makeup whiz Dick Smith, and The Rubber Gun, a 1977 film co-written by Lack and director Alan Moyle, which is currently seeking a Canadian partner in assembling a special edition release with rare materials from Lack's own private archives. What you need me for is to introduce our guest of honor this evening, Mr. Stephen Lack. You look my own. You're looking well. Thank you. You a lot worse at the end of the movie, but you look okay. I recovered. It's good. We're all very I'm in recovery. From scanning people? It's the ephemeral habit, I assume. Scanning people is all right. It's when you get scanned back that's a problem. That's true. It's a feedback thing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious now, 35 years later, how, it, like, how it feels to be so associated so closely with such a like it is an iconic film for Canadian cinema. Outside of Canada, it was this weird little movie, but here it's just never really gone away. Mostly because my client side blows up Louis Del Grande in the first five minutes, and everybody else is just like the guy from Seeing. Things. Oh. So what's it like, like carrying that around now, <coughs> yeah, 35 years later, we're still talking about it? Actually, I mean, uh, I don't want to pump it up too much, but uh, Scanners is not just limited to Canada. No, but like it's just... No, 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 I, I mean like all the American networks, if, if you, I don't know if there's such a thing as a history of television, mm. but every year, or a couple of years, during ratings week, Right. Whatever Fox Channel or whatever, for years, Scanners has been on their program and they use it to boost ratings. So whether it's for that unusual uh, scene in the end or at or in the beginning when Mr. Del Grotti gets it, um, and the story behind that is amazing. I, uh, there's there's a, a great artist, I don't know if anyone's uh, who did one of the most reprehensible pieces, uh, and, and he got banned by the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts, um, Andreas Serrano. Oh, yeah. Piss okay. Christ. Piss Christ. I can say it. I didn't want to say it. You can I say, can say it. it. I write for now. So every time I see him, he's usually, or he used to, now I think he's settled down, but he used to have like two stewardesses, one on each side. And he'd always go to the stewardess. He says, this is guy from Scanners. Oh, do you know Stephen? He's from Scanners. And, you know, the girls were like, oh, oh yeah, wow, like, you know, they knew nothing. But I got to tell you, I mean, yeah, I got a lot of cue from him. It's a, um... <laughs> What's that? Did I say something wrong? No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, I will. <laughs> but it is a, um... It does, it's like, even among Cronenberg's films, which are frequently controversial when they're released. Like, I remember as a kid, the first understanding I had that Scanners was a thing, because in 1981, I would have been 
13, was watching Siskel and Ebert argue about it on PBS because I was too little to get to see the film. Mm. Don't we miss them? I, God, yes. It's, uh, speaking as a critic, bemoaning the state of film criticism currently is kind of sad, but oh. yeah, that was a better era. People actually fought for stuff harder. Now we're a Beavis and Butthead well, uh, enlarged. It's clickable. If it clicks, yeah. there is me like in journalism. There's this thing, this trope called "if it bleeds, it leads." The more violent the story, the more prominently it'll be placed on the front page. There is no like "if it's sick, they'll click" thing yet. Although I think I just coined it. Yeah, but there we go. Like scanners would be a viral sensation now. I think if it was the kind of thing yes. that emerged into the world. Yeah, I think the head exploding. Uh, you know, and, and probably people will have personal computers that can laminate that effect on all kinds of things. I think you can. I probably you could have your cat's head explode if you have the right algorithm, you know. Or, you know, I mean, why not turn it into porn? I mean, I'm sure someone has. I, I was borderline. Rule you know, 34. One of David's biggest battles was to get it from being rated triple X to just R. Scanners. Scanners, yeah. They had to, the head exploding, Mr. Del Grande's head, um, it was, it was a beautiful setup, unbelievable. It was like this a, is a fantastic story, if you guys don't know it. Yeah, it's, it was like a science fiction dentist's office, okay? Which is David's specialty. And everybody was behind a barrier, and, uh, and all the cameras were covered in polyethylene or whatever, drop cloths, etc. Except for their lenses were exposed. And Gary Zeller, the late Gary Zeller, he passed away about a year ago, and he was one of the special effects people who did everything but the head, the final head exploding, which was Dick Smith. And um, they had failed miserably doing the first exploding head of Del Grande. Uh, it happened in a second. They didn't really capture it. And so instead, they did a rubber reproduction of his head. And they layered it with about 40 layers of rubber blood, rubber blood, rubber blood. And then Gary, who was ex-Special Forces for the American military, uh, he got underneath the chair that was supporting the head with a shotgun. And the cameras were all around. There were three cameras. And one of the cameras, I'm going to go back to the dentist's office with the image. One of the cameras shot, I think, 400 frames a second so that it could be slowed down. I believe it was something they used for wildlife photography, like capturing birds in flight for TV documentaries? Yeah. Or bullets before they hit you, sure. you know? <laughs> things like that. Scientific you know? purposes. So, uh, is it, and they had to say, at 400 frames a second, it's like, <laughs> you know? So, anyway, so that was only one of the cameras. They had different things. If they didn't want to lose this, they only had one or two of these heads. And what you see is, the compromise, not that it hurt anybody, because obviously it still surprises, shocks, and sickens a few people, um, but the original footage had to be reduced to keep it out of the X category. So that reduction was done on a frame-by-frame -frame basis with the sensors there. I, I think I'm right on that. I believe you are. I mean, I remember that there was talk about it in taking it back and forth. But for, for years and years, and in Ontario especially, Cronenberg was sort of the, uh, the black sheep of Canadian cinema. He, uh, he had the to dark cut God. the dark prince, that's right, the prince of blood, I think was how McLean's referred to him. But he couldn't actually keep, this always fascinated me, because of the, the laws at the time, the Ontario Censor Board would not allow David Cronenberg to keep a print, a finished print of The Brood in Ontario. He could not own his own film in an unfinished, in its finished form. He, he had to have the cut version uh, because they had to cut 40 seconds of a dwarf beating someone to death with a, with a crystal snow globe. Ooh. So that, because it, it implied child violence, even though it was an actor and it wasn't a real brood child baby, I'm pretty sure there aren't any. But he couldn't actually keep it. Chris, Chris was one left. You know the one. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> don't. Just don't tell me where he lives. I don't ever want to run into him. Um, You're soaking in it, man. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the scanner's fights, I know, were more confined. Uh, the stuff at the end, nobody had a problem with, even though people's eyes, blow, your eyes blow out. And right. people are covered with goo and blood and horror. It was only the opening because of the shock value, because it comes out of nowhere. It was scanner on scanner crime. So that's okay. Yeah. I don't. I think we're okay. I want to know. Yes. But I. But I really. 
you mentioned Dick Smith, who famously did the effects for The Exorcist and a, and a, a number of really classic horror films back when practical effects were the only effects. And Correct. you said now you could CG a cat blowing up. And with scanners, you had to wear that. You had to be built into this stuff, and it had to be built onto you. So how long did that final sequence take, not to shoot, but to prep? Like, how many hours were you in makeup? Oh, um, before you actually got to shoot? I, to me, you know, I don't have the greatest memory, you know. I, I think the most difficult thing was the casting of the head. You see, Dick Smith's mm. specialty was, and this was breakthrough, uh, he would cast the actor's head and uh, then apply uh, bladders or foam rubber appliques that, uh, you know, fulfilled the intention of the character if it was aging, like Dustin Hoffman in Little Big Man, or he did prosthetics for uh, Brando and different people in The Godfather. I mean, this guy, if you check out his CV, was phenomenal. And of course, he was a workaholic. I was in a panel in LA at one of the uh, uh, conventions and I've only been to two or three of those conventions in all these years. I did it. I'm over it. And, uh, and, and I, I was on the dais with this. And there were 11 other special effects people, all of whom who owed their careers to Dick Smith's work and his generosity in communicating his work. He never patented things. If you wanted to know how he did something, he told you. And there was one guy up there, I mean, I don't know their names, but he had written to Dick Smith as a kid, and you're too young to remember famous monsters of film. Yeah, I grew up on Fangoria. I was oh, the next said, generation. Okay, so Fangoria, so they had the reader's page of all the yeah, kids yeah. with all the makeup on. Well, those kids used to write to Dick Smith, and, and eventually he would answer them if, if their products were worthy of his attention. And one guy got up there and he said, you know, I was 16 years old and I, I sent something to Dick Smith and I never heard back. And then, uh, you know, uh, my mother called me and said, come, come down, there's a guy from upstate New York named Dick Smith who wants to talk to you about a letter you sent him four months ago. And there was Dick on the phone to like a 16, 17 year old kid saying, I got your, your letter, your product, it's amazing. I apologize for not having uh, called you. I was in Thailand doing the film, you know? So that's how Dick Smith was. He, yeah. he was just an amazing, generous, focused, you know, uh, almost autistic. He was so fine tuned to his craft and solving the problems. Right. And so what was the process like for you once oh, you had well, the cast it was, on? It was, was harrowing because uh, I had it in my contract because my uh, priority, my bias, is to be a painter. And so I make paintings most of the time. You can check me out on Facebook, blah, blah, blah. But the real deal <laughs> is, is that uh, I didn't, uh, it was because I knew we had done The Exorcist and I didn't want my eyes to be tampered with, you know? So it was in my contract, you know, you can you can do anything you want, but not as eyes. Of course, they woke me up early in the morning and I forgot that I had ever done that, which is quite typical, and I didn't have my wife watching over me in those days. And so I went in there and Dick froze my eyes and put cups over them and then had me sit in something with tubes up my nose so I could breathe and told me with my frozen eyes that I was to keep them open. Why well, do you try and keep your frozen eyes open while well, you've got plaster or rubber or some crap on top of your face hardening and not just on top of your face? So, because his deal was he wanted to cast it with the eyes open so we didn't have to sculpt eyes open, which would be less realistic for what you just saw. So that was pretty much the most difficult part of it. The rest of it, I was just sitting still. Anyway, that, that, was, that was that process. And how long, how many days were spent on that final sequence? Was it, was it easy to shoot? Was it a long thing with all the effects? Well, they had done an earlier sequence during the filming of the movie. Mm -hmm. And that movie had to be a certain percentage complete by the end of the year. So I don't know whether they knew ahead of time or not that that first sequence was going to be inadequate. So they called me three months later, at which point I had forgotten the name of the movie. I'm uh, like, oh, I was already like, you know, in not vacation year, but I was back to painting. So they woke me up early in a late 70s morning and uh, did the procedure. So that was like a day. And then 
once that was cured and done, uh, we all got together and we filmed the sequence, which I think took two days, but it was beautifully orchestrated, and I was rested because I had done another film before Scanners, and they had promised me a week in between to rest, right. and of course, it was in the mail. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's, that's code for film industry lies. <laughs> Your check is in the mail. Yes, this, the independent film days in the 70s and 80s were actually probably worse in terms of, you know, the speed with which things didn't happen. You know, hurry up and wait and, and pushing projects through and then having them fall apart and jump on something else. Right. Every story I've ever heard has been like, we made this by the skin of our teeth. And now, we made this by the skin of our teeth doesn't even mean that anymore because you're not burning film, you're shooting digitally, you have more freedom, more space. Right. It's a film that was clearly made by people who knew exactly what they were doing in a really weird genre, in like sort of chronicles. Oh, you mean Scatters? Yeah. Scatters now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a playful film for what it is. It's a thriller, but it's also sort of experimental in the way that it presents the scanning sequences. and the, right. like just I love, even now, seeing Yorkdale Station as a futuristic <laughs> meeting place. The first movie was shot in Montreal, which is why it's really fun to see in Toronto and oh, it was It was shot in Montreal <coughs> on a set that when you were doing the actual filming and you had your mic on, you uh, it was so cold and it was so damp because the fiscal year ends at the end of December. And so they started shooting in the middle of November. We had a six week shoot, if I remember correctly. And the sound stage was a new situation where somebody had donated part of the harbor and that was where the sound studios were. So if you, I don't know whether it's been, because that's a Criterion version that they projected tonight, mm -hmm. and Criterion goes through frame by frame and fixes things. But in maybe some of the earlier prints, you might be able to see people's breath in the interiors, because the heaters were these flame heaters, and they have a frequency that interferes with your lavaliers, your microphones. So it was freezing. So when you see me walking like this, it's not because, like, you know, I got a bad disc or anything like that. It's because I don't want a fucking cold. <laughs> <laughs> this is another way you know it's a Canadian movie, of course. Yes. Yeah. Oh, jeez, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to throw it open to you guys. Uh, does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Uh, oh, this, you jumping up and down right here. He looks like a plant. Do you have any uh, good stories about working with Patrick McGowan? Did he talk about the prisoner at all on set? Well, the prisoner was understood. I mean, that's uh, we, we gave him respect. It was I. I really enjoyed working with Patrick. Patrick had his uh, flaws, but he was he was he was terrific. Uh, he was incredibly intelligent. Uh, we had a problem with the script insofar as it hadn't been completely written, and McGowan, unlike myself, wanted to understand what the character was. And he was trying to get, you know, what he was supposed to be doing if he couldn't see the beginning or the end, and he was being handed pink and different color pages, which signified which script was going to be used that day. So he was, he was not a happy puppy, but he had some other weaknesses that were distracting him from a linear focus. But nonetheless, he was uh, a genius, and uh, as he, he told me, he once was uh, an understudy at like 19, in Hamlet, not on understudy, he was like an extra or something, and the, the lead actor faded out, and he memorized the whole of Hamlet in two nights and took over the lead role. So he's an exceptional person with a terrific imagination, etc., etc. And when you're dealing with somebody who's that professional and has a history, you've got to, you know, and, and me being this, I don't know whether I, I don't know how to categorize myself, but uh, I was a bit freer, and uh, I was, what I was bringing to it was something, uh, you know, almost like a clenched thing inside as a reaction to the externals that I couldn't quite decode. And that kind of departure point, and it being something that maybe no one else has really done that way, which unnerves a lot of people, which contributes to the tension of the film, it, to most people. And um, there's a couple of people like Rona Barrett who thought that, oh, Mr. Lack lacks talent and all <laughs> that. But we were running lines, and McGowan says to me, he says, uh, where did you study acting? 
go to school. And I said, Patrick, I studied at the Oscar Levant School of Acting. Now, no one here knows who Oscar Levant is. I know who Oscar Levant is, do you? Yeah. And he gave me that look, and it was like, you know, warm soup. You know, heating up his belly, he like looked and he knew. I mean, because it was a make or break moment. We were in the Winnebago. Otherwise, I would have been in the doghouse. And it was like a high five moment. And after that, Patrick and I became great friends. And we kept in contact over, you know, a period of a couple of years afterwards. And we had both, I don't know whether this is a famous person or not, Alexis Canner. He was a, a bad man you know. on the Montreal. Uh, Sir Winston Churchill pub scene, I guess, or something. I don't know. I don't. I don't know whatever happened to him, but uh, he had an excessive imagination, and uh, Patrick had worked with him on a, um, a very long and involved movie that may or may not have ever been released. I think it was once. It's, it's like a science fiction, uh, not science fiction. It's a political paranoia film, which is the de rigueur now about sure, you know, yeah. plots and things like that, and might have even been a precursor to the Prisoner or. Who knows? So Patrick and I were great friends. He told me some terrific stories, and uh, and I was very saddened when the Academy did not put him his face up there oh, for the right. obituary. He, 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 he was not part of it. You know, I mean, he was so amazing, and he, he had his problems. He said uh, one time he had a fight with his wife. And uh, I guess they live somewhere in Beverly Hills or God knows where. He said, and I, I put on, I mean, she had a straight jacket, and so she put me in the straight jacket. And I, I walked about five miles to the Beverly Hills Hotel with the straight jacket, and I went in and I had them serve me a drink. And then I went home in the straight jacket. <laughs> he was fabulous. I just love extreme people. Those are the stories you want to have. I don't think I told that one, but yeah, you know, he's gone in the family. You know, his, his wife was nice. She, you know, we talked. Mm -hmm. And he was a family person. Yeah, he was. Everybody I've ever I've never met him, but everyone I've spoken to about him always says he was warmer than you would think. Like he was. Yes. He's an imposing man, but he wasn't actually so. It sounds like you got that experience. Well, no, no, he was. He, he was. He could turn it on. He was very upset with Jennifer. In the film. Like, no, not because of the film, but she had had four previous marriages, ah. and so the it got his Irish up. Really? Uh, he's Roman Irish. Right, sure. You know, it got his skirts ruffled to watch with all the gold crosses. What's this matter with you, girl? You just can't see the right man. Time for you to settle down and have more than puppies. Yeah, that's kind of a paternalistic attitude towards your co-star, but sure. Uh, I love the idea, too, of what you said about being coiled and tense and not giving something back, not being, being protective in character, because the idea of a mind reader who doesn't know what's going on is something that fascinates me about Scanners, that our central character is the guy who's been completely removed from all of this, and yet he is capable of all yes, this stuff. Well, don't piss him off. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I know. I, I mean, I wasn't quite sure, but because I wasn't quite sure, then I played it as not quite sure. <laughs> and I would just say, David, how are we doing this scene? Am I still Alice in Wonderland? Am I still pestering the caterpillar for a direction on how to get out of mushroom land, you know? And what did and he say? How did he direct that? And he would say, you're doing fine. <laughs> you know, you just do it. The only direction he really would give uh, would be, I, I have a habit when I walk to push up and, and you walk, and so you would think, you know, or you don't know, but this is something I guess you have to be trained for, but I retired right after the film pretty much, so uh, if you walk and you push your heels up, which develops a very firm calf, which can be attractive, there is a subculture that goes for calves, and, uh, but he hated that because he couldn't edit the walk on a hop. You know what I mean? So that became a thing. Stephen, Stephen, you have to do that again. You hopped. I go, I hopped. Where did I hop? I'm doing the freaking bunny. You're doing the freaking bunny. You have to do it again. Don't hop. So, yeah, that was a, again, an inside story. Who would know? What a tiny little detail. Yeah. Get her. Yes, please.
So well, the, the question is, how does one perform a role when the role has yet to be finished, when the, when the script isn't fully written? How do you get into it? You bring yourself into it. You, you use an aspect of yourself. Uh, I, I, I've noticed through painting, and I, I said this earlier today, so I can't believe I'm repeating myself, but it happens. So the most complicated painting of a tree is still not going to be as detailed and complicated as a real tree. So any acting role where you're bringing in personality or doing anything like that, uh, you have to bring some immediacy to it. And that immediacy has to be informed by who you are. Later on, all the style that you would bring into it, all the training and all of that stuff, which will carry it in, in many cases, it really starts to look kind of like the style of the decade it was made. So when you ask me what did I, what do you do when something is unfinished or anything like that, what you do in any friggin' emergency, you land on the balls of your feet and you pivot and rotate and they'll tell you when you're comfortable, you know, or when they're comfortable with you. So that's how I deal with it. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, it's, it's just themselves. And if you know any of the other films that I made before Scanners, uh, this is a huge departure point from the different characters that I've played. And, uh, and there we go. What, was there a moment, though, when you knew that you had Cameron, when you locked in? Um, no. No, because it started, there was no linear progression. So the first scene that we did was outside the doctor's office when Jennifer O'Neill is scanned by the baby. Right, right, unborn. I was scanned by her unborn baby. Right. And, uh, and she's on the lawn, and so she's down on the ground, and I say, are you all right? Flavia. And she looks up, and she says, my name is Kim. Because <laughs> Flavia was her name in the script that I had. But she had a different script, so it changed. Flavia. So, Flavia was her original name. Uh, God knows, maybe it wasn't even the original one. Maybe there was one before that. So, uh, so I forget what the question well, was. Well, just did you did you lock? Was there? You said there was. Oh, one, when did I lock did you find him? The character? When did you know you had him? No, I left that up to David. Hmm. That was completely up to David because, like I said, everything was working backwards. Yeah. I had been handed the script while I was shooting another movie which I was concentrating on and trying to do again by the skin of my teeth. And uh, so there it is. You know, um, I haven't accumulated huge amounts of money because I find that being in a comfort zone reduces the necessity that motivates me to go on to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what I would do if I was ever comfortable. And I think the same thing is like, God forbid I should be traipsing in like, you know, some actor who thinks, well, now I'm going to lay on my vibe, you know? Sure. And so, you know, I like to keep it loose. And David seemed to be happy with it. And he, he felt, because he had approached me after seeing Rubber Gun, which I'm hoping to find while I'm here, somebody to help me digitalize it in that Canadian industry. I was going to say, a lot of them sort of films are simply not available to be seen. I, uh, I've been approached by an American distribution company. They've, they've said uh, that they would do something, but they just got their digital conversion thing and they have other films in front of it, and I'd rather keep it in Canada where it belongs, so sure. I have some of the raw materials. While I'm standing here doing the Q&A, uh, I'll, I'll say if there's anybody that uh, is affiliated with one of the Canadian institutions that preserves films, Rubber Gun, Montreal, Maine, was, has already been uh, uh, digitalized, right. so that's good. And uh, Rubber Gun, I would like that to be next. One of the co-stars has agreed, and he is not in great shape, so there's a short window of time, the last of my co-stars in that film, so that we could flesh out some of the, I, I don't know if you've seen Rubber Gun? No, uh, no, I don't think I have. Oh, well, that's an experience. And it's quite different texturally, and my performance is very much 
different from this. And David saw that, and that's why he wanted me. Okay. Uh, among some other things, we, we shared proclivities in Monte Carlo. Oh my God, we watched the races together. That was wonderful. Uh, 78. Well, we were because he was hugely into car. He still is, I assume. He still is. I sat in his Tesla just the other day. <laughs> <laughs> of course David Cronenberg would have a Tesla. No, of course David Cronenberg would have a Tesla. In 1980, yes. if I said I sat in his Tesla, boy, yeah, the I'd be in a lot of trouble and he'd have a worse reputation. All the way in the back. Did you uh, try to stay in contact with any of the people who were involved with scanners after it was completed? Or do you yes. You know, I kind of am a, like, a bit like Lenny Bruce. I'm happy to hang out with the band, you know, which doesn't necessarily mean I want to go to Vegas. So uh, I am still in touch with Joyce Zeller, for instance. Um, and she was Gary Zeller's partner, uh, and they did the special effects. So we're, we're still friends. I'm not in touch with any of the other actors that I'm aware of. Um, you sat in David's Tesla just a couple of oh days yeah, ago. Oh yeah, no, David and I are in touch. We communicate. We, we don't even have to move our lips. We have special language, David and I. And, uh, and it's, it's fun. Boy, he is such a bright puppy. It's fun to uh, bat the ball back and forth over the net of life and all of that. I would like to ask about Dead Ringers, too, because when you turn up in that, it is sort of a bookend for the 80s of Cronenberg's films. I mean, you're in 81 and 88. Yes. You're used as an artist. He betrayed me. How so? <laughs> you said take? He told me, he originally said, I, I never know what anybody wants from me. I have absolutely no idea. I only look out. I don't like to. I soap the mirrors. Okay. Even though no one's died. I soap the mirrors. And um, so, you know, he called me up and he said, OK, I want you in this thing. And, Blah, 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 because I don't feel I captured the essence of the rubber gun guy in, um, scanners. in Scanners. The closest thing you get is me as the derelict eating french fries off of other people's plates, which, you know, Saul Rubinet. He said, oh, Stephen, I can tell which scenes you directed yourself in head on, later retitled Fatal Attraction, and Scanners. And he pointed that out as, as one of the moments. And uh, anyway, so, a Dead Ringers, he wanted me to come in and uh, under the guise that he was going to uh, fulfill his lack portfolio by throwing in a little bit of rubber gun juice in one way or another. And uh, it didn't happen that way. Because uh, with rubber gun, I uh, sort of uh, ad-libbed according to the parameters that were needed for the business of propelling the plot. In other words, uh, I could do the unexpected, but still to do the expected. Right. So I had memorized some things that might or might not work, maybe three or four pages, on the two pages that he gave me. And when I arrived, he said, ah, I love you, Stephen. We don't have time for any of that. As a matter of fact, the two pages we gave you are now half a page. <laughs> ah! And by the way, he told me that I said I can do it I can do this any time except for, and I gave him a week that I couldn't do it. And of course, I got a call, that's the week we need you. So yeah, there's a certain s and relationship that you have when you give yourself into the power of the director. But they're very gentle. But they have the power. So there we go. Stephen Lack, thank you so much for coming. Happy National Canadian Film Day. Let him hear it. And remember, you don't just have to support Canadian cinema this one day. Go buy Scanners on Blu-ray. The Brood is out too. It's very good. Just buy whatever Canadian movies you want to. Go, go see stuff. There's all kinds of great stuff playing. Have a good night. Thanks to Real Canada, Toronto's Royal Cinema, Now Magazine, Norman Wilner, and Stephen Lack for presenting a great Q&A. Special editions of David Cronenberg's Scanners, Videodrome, Naked Lunch, Dead Ringers, and The Brood have been released by Criterion in packed special editions. While Lack's art can be seen at stephenlackart.com, his films are part of a huge swathe of Canadian movies essentially available nowhere. 
Besides airing on cable TV and long out of print if any home video releases, Montreal, Maine, L'Ange et la Femme, The Rubber Gun, Head On, and A 20th Century Chocolate Cake are orphaned films, just like the Patrick McGuhan Alexis Canner movie Lack was mentioning in the Q&A, a political thriller called Kings and Desperate Men, which was filmed in Montreal and at the Olympic Stadium. Some of these films are available on YouTube, which seems to be the lone place orphan films can be found, as no one north of the 49th parallel seems willing to restore, preserve, and make available these movies on physical or digital media for purchase. Yes, people would really like to buy these films. Art films and cult films tend to come from American labels, whereas tax shelter movies, good or bad, are tougher to track down. Witness Shadows in an Empty Room, otherwise known as Blazing Magnum, that was recently released via Scorpion Releasing and Kino, and Curtains and Prom Night from Synapse Films. A classic example of an orphan film is Joshua Then and Now, Ted Kotcheff's feature film version of Mordecai Richler's hysterical novel. 20th Century Fox released the film on VHS via their budget line imprint key video. CBC owns the rights to the longer TV version that features more footage but no potty words, and yet this late-night TV mainstay is now run infrequently. The soundtrack album was released only in France because its composer is the esteemed Philippe Sardes, but the movie has never been released in a longer, uncut, widescreen edition. When the film did emerge this week on DVD, it's as an on-demand import that retails roughly for $22 from Fox. This title has to be imported and sells for roughly $34 because the exchange rate is still poor and the importer has to take his cut. The print source? Likely the old 1986 three quarter inch umatic pan and scan master used for the key video edition. It's not unwatchable, but Fox saw no reason to strike a new widescreen HD version because it's just an old lesser known movie starring James Woods. You're probably better off taping the movie off showcase if and when it actually runs. Meanwhile, the CBC was also involved with Canada's most expensive production, Philip Borsos's version of Bethune, The Making of a Hero, starring Donald Sutherland. The 1990 Canada-China co-production that was released on tape, aired on pay TV, seen in a rare expanded CBC miniseries edit, and supported by an even more rare making of documentary. Where is the movie right now? Nowhere, because no one cares to spend the money and exploit a title even as a viable digital download. Stephen Lack says an American label expressed interest in releasing The Rubber Gun and Montreal, Maine's been digitized for release. I hope he gets lucky and finds a great label for his films, as the more time passes, the more these non-cult films fade away, literally becoming echoes in the memories of the few who remember seeing them and have old VHS tapings from television. A country's film culture, classic, arty, cult, or banal, shouldn't reside in boxes of beat-up VHS and beta tapes, nor heavily compressed YouTube rips. This is dumb, and my concern is that what lies on those old tapes will stay in boxes, bookshelves, basements, or in my case, a storage locker, because the few large companies that own most of the domestic rights and perhaps long uncirculated prints lack the desire to catalog, assess, digitize, and distribute their wares to a domestic and international market. I want to own Daryl Wasik's 1990 breakthrough film H, and while the film's been mastered in 2K, this classic of Canadian independent cinema is available nowhere. The best prints I have of perhaps Nick Mancuso's most intense performance, Ticket to Heaven, isn't a used MGM VHS rental tape, nor a pay TV copy, nor the gray market DVD source from a PAL print, but a CED disc released by MGM around 1981. This is not a laser disc, but a truly dead home video format that's basically a record that plays a movie. If you don't want your country's film culture to reside on dead media, the only solution is to wait until someone cares, wait until the title pops up almost by accident because of a package deal, wait for an American or European label to release it on disc, or wait for a rare film print screening at a Cinematheque and live with the memory of it rather than actually owning it. Real Canada's efforts mark a concerted effort to at least prove there's a market. And there is a market. For would-be buyers, the solution may be for labels to sort through their massive libraries and license these orphan films to existing and future independent home video labels. Reasonable rates for limited editions for domestic distribution. When a home video producer approaches you, the label, with a desire to release Two Solitudes, perhaps the second most in-demand Canadian film after The Grey Fox, offer them a reasonable fee. And not only will the film return into circulation, but you'll be kickstarting an independent specialty home video label. It's a niche market that survives with physical and digital special editions. My only question to the two to three large media companies that own almost all commercially released movies in Canada is, what have you got to lose? 
Coming next, more bonus media content tied to my reviews of Kino's The Mask, Blu-ray, and DVD. If you like this podcast, please visit kqek.com's Facebook page and follow our Twitter feed at mondomark underscore kqek. All podcasts are available via Libsyn, iTunes, and YouTube. The editorial skills responsible for this podcast are also available for hire. If you require audio editing, mixing, and cleaning up interview recordings prior to publication, please visit mondomark.com for more info and to hear demo reels. Until next time, this is Mark R. Hassan, editor of kqek.com. This podcast is copyrighted 2016 by Mark R. Hassan.